seven, six, five, Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Justine. Thanks for tuning in to the Starwood Portal. Today we have with us Udi Gall and great friend, Lior Levy. Udi is a world-renowned expert in sailing, a former Olympian athlete, and currently the 470 race team coach at Peninsula Youth Sailing Foundation in Redwood City, California. Udi has nearly 20 years of sailing experience, including coaching the US Olympic sailing team in the 2012 Olympics in London, and the Israeli sailing team in the 2016 Olympics in Rio. As a sailor, Udi competed in the 2004 and 2008 Olympics, representing Israel in the men's 470s sailing class. He is a former world and European champion, earning 11 medals in total and more than 20 World Cup medals. More recently, Udi's earned a bachelor's in psychology and communication from the IDC Hertz Lea and a master's degree in sports psychology from the John F. Kennedy University. Today, Udi is continuing his presentation on downwind tactics, where he breaks up the downwind leg into three critical moments to understand the different options one can execute to ensure a tactical advantage in, um, in line with your racing strategy. Today's focus is the Black Diamond, part two of a two-part series. You can view part one of Udi's presentation on the Starboard portal, and this presentation you will also be able to re review on the portal. Please be sure to ask questions for Udi in the chat and also tell us where you're tuning in from. Last but not least, we want to welcome special guest, Lior Levy, friend and former men's 470 sailor from Israel, um, who placed second in the world championships. He's a two-time Optimus world champion as a coach, um, and Lior is based in Miami, Florida, where he runs a performance coaching outfit sailing. All right, gentlemen, let's begin. Udi, let's start with you. Hi, everyone. So the surprise of today is that we joined, we, we brought Lior, and Lior is joining us, and the presentation will be in Hebrew today. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Lior. How are you doing? Good to see you. I'm I'm doing good. It's uh, officially summer here in Miami. Been storming afternoon in the past four days straight. So that's it. Um, everything the, the is good storm here. Storm. Sorry, storm coming on the winter, not on the summer. <laughs> yeah, here in, in the summer. But all good. I'm happy to be here and chime in when everyone when needed. Maybe challenge you a little bit and mainly learn from you uh, about how, how to sail downwind. I'm also interested. Please do. So just a quick story about it. <clears throat> when after I sailed for many years with Gidi, I think it was 13 years together, uh, I needed a change. We all needed a change a little bit. So I started sailing with Leo and we sailed together. First of all, Leo is one of the talented sailors I ever sailed with. Amazing coach, of course. And Leo, when we joined the boat, when we start sitting together, and I mentioned it last week, is like, Udi, I want to learn everything about your downing. I said, your downing philosophy. I said, what are you talking about? This file that you wrote. I said, what? And that was like 15 years before that. And then he sent me over the email, this file that I wrote some, somewhere in there when I was 17. I said, what? That's actually really nice. <laughs> it's not so bad. Obviously, some new adjustment needed. Yeah. But, and then Justine and recall that we're all good friends with Justin and this is how this, pre this presentation came up. So I will start now to continue from last week. Just to uh, briefly, I will go to some of us. There's some people that were here or not. And I just want to go, even those that were here briefly about some of the stuff that we talked last week, which relevant for today, obviously, like Justine said, I would recommend to go and start after this presentation, or if you want to go back to the information, the, the other presentation is still online and recorded. I would recommend to go there and start from the beginning. It's, I know it's a lot of information and we'll try to keep it as simple as possible. I know sometimes it's hard. I just briefly what we did last last week, um, I broke down the downwind to few aspects. 
The main thing is the, the tactical sailing, and that's the focus on this presentation, not because it's the most important thing of the downwind, um, but it's, it is critical to um, for have a successful downwind in order to, to be able to, uh, to produce high boat speed and correct strategy or to execute your plan A, you will want to have the right tactical maneuver situation positions. So the tactical aspect is the most important. Obviously the downwind strategy, when I look about the downwind strategy is more about the race course. How do I sell the race course as fast as I can? And of course there is a shift, gas and lulls, current, the S curve that we talked last week, I will mention it again today. And the 80-20 rule that a lot of us know and talk about it to stay away, not to go all the way to the lane and have some room to play on a downwind. I like to call it the third rule because we have bigger variety on the downwind. And you're, here I have a question for you as a, as a coach. When you talk to your athletes and your sailors, what is it that you, what is, what do you, what is the focus that do you want them to, to sell? Like in strategy, tactic, what is the main thing that you ask them to focus on? Well, it all depends in my perspective uh, of the sea state and the conditions and the level of uh, and, this, and, this, and their skill sets. But let's say it's even and we're all uh, having solid boat handling and can control whatever decision we want to do. So of course, is uh, for, first of all, is your positioning and the downwind uh, and the proper proper shift and into the long long head attack that's the most important thing after that getting connected with the angles of the waves the angle of sailing clear air big big clear air lines very important skipper looking constantly backwards and of course to capitalize and consolidate uh, positioning yourself if it's stable or unstable if you can predict the shift or not between the competition and the mark so you can think about the next move and what you're going to um, be able how you be able to benefit when the next step is going to happen great so again I love that and I love the positioning and like executing and I like I, I, the way I said yesterday, there's so many factors and you should have like kind of a mental list and every time, every time, every situation, every down when you kind of prioritize something else according to condition. You mentioned uh, the shifts and that's actually interesting for me because one of the biggest feedback people sent me emails, reach out to me and said, you said that the shifts are not that, that important. How is that? And I have a theory about it and uh, I would like to uh, go briefly on that. What is your uh, philosophy about shift on the down when you mentioned that? Um, first of all, these days, everyone's sailing with compass and we're always looking at the compass upwind, perfect. Um, but we got to remember, we have also the compass downwind. But the thing is, on the downwind, the angles are changing more than on the upwind. So you got to develop the feeling and a lot of ways that I think you actually helped me to realize it at that time is what is your ang bow angle to the wave? And just like on a map where you have two dots, you can put a, stra a straight line. If you had a third ident uh, identification factor, then it's gonna be even more uh, accurate. So the third identification uh, factor for me it's for the first one is the bow angle to the wave. Then of course the wave angle to the stern and how you do, and then the, the jib, how the jib lines up in, in each different change of shift. And that's how I know how to read the shift of the downwind. Yeah, I like, I like that you mentioned that the idea of the, of the shift. I think that's a, actually a big factor how they, they because our angle is so so big on the downwind and we can go so close so so much 
and um, actually sometimes the shift, we almost can sell some of the boards, we can almost sell 180 degrees straight to the mark, but sometimes the shift affecting how well are we serving, surfing on, on the wave. So I think I love how you said it, that, that I use the shift in order to be on the right tack relative to the, to the, to the waves. And this is for me, like you said, that the, the compass on the downwind is not that a, a, a big value because you, your, your angle change consistently. But sometimes you're trying to surf the waves and you feel that the boat's stuck. They're not surfing the well down, uh, down properly. I would suggest just to, to try to do a jive and you will be surprised how much the, the opposite tack will serve the wave so, so well. My last point about the shift, people reach out to me about the shift. And again, how is this not that important for you? I said, I'm not saying they're not important. Shift is important, especially the first shift, the handoff to start the downwind on the, on the correct shift, the header, the opposite and the upwind. But one thing I want to mention, I mentioned it last week, I said that our angles, most of the boats are much lower than the 45 degrees. So the, 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 the split of the fleet is much smaller. So every shift, every five or 10 degrees shift affecting less on the downwind. That's why I said they are less important. And the other thing is, and that's one of the things I said last week, we potentially we have a, in most of the, in the bigger, bigger area of the downwind, we have two to three jive, not more than that, especially until the last black diamond. And the reason is that when you're setting up, when you're setting towards the gust and the shift. So the rhythm of the shifts are much more uh, um, frequent. You, you are, you are phasing much more shift on the upwind. On the downwind, you're sitting together with the gas, to get, together with the shift, and you're, you're facing less shift than the upwind. So the upwind, the, if, you, if the shift goes back and forth every three minutes, when you're setting upwind, it will be almost two minutes. Well, when you're setting downwind, it will become every four minutes. So when you think about it, of a leg of 10 or 12 minutes, you have much more tax to do on the upwind than jive to do on the downwind. Let's move on uh, briefly. Again, I like, like you said, the technique, how we serve the wave, how we adjust our boat and everything, how we produce the boat speed and the boat setup. There's a lot of adjustment to do because our angles changes consistently and our angle to the, to the waves and everything and different, different angle, different modes. And lastly, of course, is the boat handling, which is very important, especially for the tactic sailing. <clears throat> so Udi, again, before you before you get started, um, we do have one comment about the shift conversation. Um, Philip Hubble says maybe the shifts downwind are less important to the leader who is sailing more like a match racer. Any comments on that? So I would I would agree that the, the leader, like I said last week, you need to find the balance between setting the 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 clear air outside of the course and then wants to go and protect the consolidate be in the middle of the course but then you have less power so your ability to sell with your ability to sell with according perfectly to the shift is a bit more limited so you need to find this fine balance in between and just to sell more protective and then consolidate defensively with the fleet any thought about that leo I mean, if you have the idea in your mind of sailing the shortest distance and the fastest to the mark, reading the waves, the shifts, sailing fast, clear air, no one will be able to pass you. Yes, they're coming from behind on the downwind. They're going to catch up, no doubt. So mentally, you got to be strong and understand that on the downwind, uh, maybe there will be possibilities of boats getting close to you. But at the end, it doesn't matter if you finish in front of them one meter or 25 meters or 100. One meters. inch or 500 feet, it's still a first. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So my downwind distribution, the way I like to see it is the, 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 the top first peak, the, the, the top, margin, uh, top, top mark rounding is the handoff and the actually rounding the tactical situation before and after in order to... Uh, to have the right position to execute 
the big chunk, the, the, the big area, the, the long area, so you can produce the, the right strategy or high boat speed. The second peak is the jibe. Here on the, this map, it's on the left-hand side, but it can occur a few, few areas on the downwind. So how you prepare yourself and how you execute proper, um, I like to call it the big, the macro transition, like and every jibe or set, how do you prepare yourself and execute it well? And then again, come another big chunk of the straight sailing. Hopefully you have the right position. You can produce a high boat speed and you're on the right shift and position where you want to be. And what we're going to talk today is the, the, the bottom part of the downwind. Like you, you mentioned, Leo, the, the, key, the fleet is going to catch up it's a lot because they're blocking some of the wind and the, the downwind one is becoming very hectic and, 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 and crowded. So over there, the, all the situation becoming a bit more complicated. The first peak again, like I said, is the top rounding. Second peak, we spoke on those two topics uh, last week. Second peak is the, is the time of jibe, time to jibe, a few times around the downwind. And the, the, the third part is what we talked today, the black down, diamond. A couple of things I think we need to focus here is like the handoff, the handoff towards the upwind or to the reach needs to come briefly before this black diamond. Again, when we are coming into this last portion of the down, it's so complicated, things are changing so much. So we want to make the handoff or the plan for the next leg ahead because then your head is becoming, your focus too much towards the other boat, too much boat handling, your head goes down, a lot of time into the boat because of some technical things in the boat, spinnaker care dowsing and send the boat down and stuff like that. And then so you want to produce the handoff, at least the plan A for the next leg before that portion. And potentially if you have any doubt or every situation, I like to all the time prioritize the inner side of the mark rounding. Most of the time it's port rounding. Sometimes we have starboard rounding, some other kind of courses or so the last leg. And of course there is a gate. So, but think about prioritize the in, inner side. Some of the questions that I like to ask myself before coming to this gate, and I would like to hear your opinion as well, Leo, is what would you do if I would, if, if I would be on the other boat, what, what would I try to do? So I think it's important all, every tactical situation, every place on the downwind, every place on the race, but especially on this, uh, uh, the bottom part of the downwind, the black diamond, try to go into the head of the other boat, what they will try to do, and then you will be more ready for that. I, I would like to ask myself, is that situation, are we coming with advantage or disadvantage? Do I want to maintain that? Do I want to change the situation? Am I, am I inside or outside to a boat, to a pack? How do I deal with that? Um, how Sometimes the maneuver over there is very complicated. Sometimes we are doing double jibe or what a lot of people like to, to do like rodeo jibe is the jibe without flipping the spinnaker pool and a jibe to a reach and then you need to jump on a wire and set the, the, the guy or jibe and jibe and douse and go in the upwind. It's that the maneuvers are very complicated. So how you pre prepare yourself to this so simplify the, the upcoming maneuver or maneuvers. And, and again, the most important thing, what is the bigger thing that I need to be worried about towards this down, last part of the portion of the downwind. Do you have any thought about, about that here? I mean, you mentioned uh, a lot of different type of uh, combinations of possibilities of maneuvers. If you speak to a lot of my sailors, um, we start every single practice with a boat handling drill that uh, includes at the bottom mark. Actually, there's sometimes no mark at the bottom mark. There's only top mark, but at the bottom mark, they got a jibe from um, a port to starboard, douse on the, wind, on the windward side on the starboard, jibe again into port on the imaginary mark, straight into a roll tack, and uh, going up out on the starboard again. So that, simulates approaching on the inside of the mark 
dowsing, jai approaching at the inside of the mark, jibing, dowsing, going upwind, tacking, all around us. So in a, to be able to think what is the other boat is gonna do, to be able to protect your position, to be able to attack from behind. In my opinion, you have to have a solid, solid understanding of, of your boat handling, developing the skills, and then be able to, to execute it. And I believe that if you are confident with and practice these very high intensity maneuvers, then, then you can start thinking about other things and not just get surprised or caught or delayed or unable to execute that and get past. I think I, I totally agree to find this balance between the confidence, of course, between what you are capable of and or not, and then simplify the, the maneuver over there. Or if you know that you are com uh, capable of doing this complicated maneuver, and then you can set actually a plan according to your tools that you have in your toolbox. I like that. So when we are talking about this last portion, this is the focus today of the of the third pick, the, the, the black diamond, I like to call it again. I said last week, the reason I call it is like, we are from Israel, <laughs> living in a desert. I never, I didn't ski so much when I was a young kid. I started ski the last few years, like, like when I saw the black diamond, I said, oh, wow, this is so complicated for me. And I think it's, uh, you can correlate it together with the last bit of the downwind, which is so complicated. Today I'm doing better, still avoiding the double black diamond. You guys are better, better, better than me on that. And, but two tips about that is like, try to avoid this middle of the, of the black diamond. And um, this area is, uh, have less pressure because the fleet is like congested over there and like it's actually blocking the air. So it's a, a very crowded, a, a lot of maneuvers inside over there. You don't want to be in the middle of the pack. And I would just try to avoid the middle. And because of that, sometimes it's, I like to say it, okay, when you get to the top, you kind of want to aim your down into the, to the, to do the peak of the diamond. And then from there, like the, those arrows are coming, go outside again and come strong and hot. And that's why, how I like to see it. And you've thought about that, Leo? No, I, I agree with you. Yeah. Um, one of the things I mentioned, thank you. And one of, one of the uh, things, I mentioned last week is like the the, the S curve. It's potentially a commonly downwind. If you if you if you will be able, some of the Olympic classes can do that, or in big boat series, you have the GPS tracker. And if you look on the downwind, most of the common downwind is you will see this uh, S curve that appears on the on the on the downwind. Obviously, there is a more than once and sometimes there is some small tap, uh, steps into that but again you can see two or three jibes here that's why how i would like to see the downwind of my sailors when i look at them and as you see on this uh, illustration it's like when you come into the bottom of the mark it doesn't matter if it's one mark or a gate all the fleet is actually congested to one area and it's becoming very hectic and complicated over there one of, what are the things that we want to focus here? Again, well, like we said, it's super complicated. And the, the scenarios over there is like unlimited. And that's what's beautiful about sailing. There's never, this is never the same. Something just to make it simple though, to remember or your mental, your mental list. Um, focus, you need to shift your focus back to the tactical situation. The big portion will be, is behind us, the boat speed and like the, the last shift or anything is less relevant. I'm not saying it's not relevant, it's less relevant. And um, it's becoming the most critical area again, because all the fleet comes together a lot of time when we see packs of boats, sometimes 20 boats comes together and running one mark. So it's becoming um, very crowded. So the, uh, it's, it's becoming very critical. One small mistake, you can lose many boats. Uh, distant and most of it is the control towards the, 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 the next leg or the rest of the race. I saw so many times of some of my sailors that, that they're doing small mistake over there and their race is just flipped. Like from becoming third or fourth, they're doing this mistake at the end of, of the downwind and then 
by from doing an amazing race so far, uh, doing a mistake, the last three, five, sometimes even more than 10 boats, and then it's like done for the race and they're trying to fix this small mistake that they did over there. So it's becoming super critical. If you can plan and imagine the, the next step, the, to have a scenario what the things can happen, the next 30 seconds, um, you, can, you can gain significantly. You are, you are coming in advantage. To, to try to imagine, to have this visual situation, what will come next with the one or two or the pack of boards that are around you, that's a, a very important skill and ability to have on the water. And as we said, there's a lot of parameters and they change consistently. Every board length that you're moving in this, this, this um, black diamond, it's a new situation. Even if you didn't do anything, you are just moving from the right side of the, of the course to the left side. Another board joining in, board is moving to a jibing, a lot of maneuvers going on. So it's all the time changing. And again, the chances to, to have a success or a failure, it's, it's high over there. So if you're doing it correctly, you can, you can gain a lot. Oh, of course, what we don't want is to lose a lot. I, I broke the down for some few picks. Um, sorry for that. One of the things I want to talk about is the 80-20 rule. We talk a lot about the third rule. Again, on a downwind, this 80-20 um, this is becoming bigger, third rule, because we can soak lower. And if someone is jibing on top of us, um, we we can soak low and do a better job in, uh, here. And this is something that we need to remember how not to sail all the way to the lane line because we can easily get trapped. So sometimes uh, the, 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 one th the one thing I want to say here is as much as you get closer to the mark or to the, you're relative closer to the mark, you want to jibe um, closer to the ley line and as much as you're further away you actually want to jab a bit far away from the ley line so you have an opportunity to do another step or um or another or to soak low or um to do another step outside to have a free air not to say such a long distance but actually when you are close to the three board lengths you sometimes if you are jiving close to the other boat for example, you don't care even to jibe and let them even roll you to windward as long as you can maintain the, the inside and the overlap. So it's how far are you from the mark? I think it's important factor of where you are actually positioning yourself relative to your opponent and, and the other boats. So, I kind of collected a few common situations on the downwind. And of course, there are like endless situations. And every situation is different on the water. But I would like to go to a few, few situations that and we'll, I want to look on what are the, the, the options of each boat. And of course, it can be a boat or a pack of boats. And what are our options? How can we deal from each side? So the first situation is two boats approaching to, I want to say, I want to clarify that this black diamond is anywhere be, be, between a little bit before, briefly before the three board length zone, because another three board length zone is a different situation. Basically you have the inside or not. And it's more about technical boat handling th uh, thing. And so this is about 50 feet sometimes or big boats even more. And sometimes out even three to five hundred feet. So it's very this black diamond. It's big range. It depends on the size of the fleet, the boat the conditions. So if we are coming two boats approaching on starboard tack to the right ley line into this black diamond, the outside boat relative to the mark. If we are running on port, um, they don't want to stay there. Otherwise, they, we are sailing all the way to the starboard ley line with both of the boat jibe, and then this out, out, outside boat stay on the out um, on the on the outside lane toward the mark. Then the the mark running is less good. 
So what they want to do is to initiate a high mode before the ley line and to open some gap and space between the boat to the leeward of them. So they can go in a high mode and then jive to a high mode before the ley line. And then two things can happen. They want to put a high pressure and, and they want to put a doubt. Obviously the, the opponent wants to push you all the way to the ley line. They want to put a doubt on the other opponent. Should I protect the inside or should I avoid doing too many maneuvers? And or that the, the, the other boat jibe on you and there is another potential two or three more jibes or they actually gave up and then you potentially have the inside. And this is one of the illustration that I did from yesterday. Again, we are the blue boat. We are the outside boat coming down to the three boat lengths. So let's see, they are heading up a little bit, opening the space. If we continue like this all the way, down to the right ley line, this red line, we will be the outside boat and the gray boat will, we, will, will win. I want the, the, the blue boat to head up, open some space so they can jive and then hopefully the other boat will give up and then we are going in three boat lengths while we are the inside. The other option is that the gray boat will jive with you and potentially we have another two jives that potentially are bigger mistakes. Any thoughts here, MBO? Oh, I, I I totally agree with you. And then if if that boat, the gray boat, is uh, late for some reason, does not see what is happening, and the blue boat, as you said, going to drive back, she's now also going to be on starboard and the inside. And it's the fact that when you have a plan, the chances to be to have a successful execution goes up. I agree. When, you and when you're reacting to someone and then, like you said, putting pressure and then he's asking himself, oh, oh what's going on? He's, he, what is he going to do? Now it's, not, it's all happening very fast. Most likely he's going to miss the opportunity to defend his position. I, I totally agree. I think uh, I will take what you said is First of all, you need to have a plan. And that's what one of the things we're trying to do here is like, okay, this is the common situation. What is my plan? Is the inside boat or the outside boat, each side of the, uh, of the playing field. And two things that I like to think about um, when it coming to a um, tactical situation. One is you want to be the, initi the initiator. You want to, to have the plan you want to take the initiate and you want to attack or to be in control. And if you put, if you get to the point that you put the opponents on a doubt, you already have the advantage and potentially you will have a window of opportunity to gain. Second is the other thing that I think is very important and it comes to a tactical situation, timing. Timing is the most important key on those situations. And as we go further on those situation, you will, we will see why the timing is so important. If we take this situation and we flip it, and now we are the inside boat, we are the, the, the what we saw now, the great boat, the defense boat. What I like to see a lot of time is this boat has to stay close. What I like to, um, again, a lot of, one of the things that we are we're using a lot in, our, in my team with my sailors is like, we have a keywords. I don't know if you're using it, and, but I like to say, it, call it bow to stand. Stick your bow to the opponent's stand. Don't, don't afraid to lose one or two boarding. Just make sure that you are riding their stand so they cannot jive to port and they cannot uh, spacing out, separate themselves and execute this jive. And this situation will prevent the other, the other board to jive. And one of the things I'm saying here, in case of a doubt, if the other board is actually jibing, your instincts, your default mode is actually to protect the inside of the rounding. And again, here's the opposite. We are the blue boat now. We are the inside boat. As we see, if we continue like that, we have this one and a half board length, one, one and a half board length advantage. I don't care about it. I don't care about losing this distance in order to have control and to simplify the approach toward the three board lengths. So as the blue boat, I want to head up and stick my bow to the other boat's turn and preventing from them to jive in. 
again, we need to do it early enough. The timing is super important. I'm heading up, staying close, riding their stern. And then now the other boat is basically, basically locked and we have control. We can push them all the way to the ley line. And here, if we are jiving, we are jiving into three ball lengths and the situation is simple. Any thoughts here? No, uh, solid, solid uh, video you, you came up with, I like it. <laughs> yeah, it took me a few hours. Every video like this takes some time. Justine, are we good with the questions? Again, I, I got a lot of questions this past week over the email I will recommend and promote everyone to ask questions now. It's great, we have Leo here, it's, it's just amazing. Um, yeah, definitely. I mean, there is um, some comments on the videos and animations. Um, I think they're they're quite impressive, and people are um, liking to see that, especially now in our virtual world. I think any questions that were sent in last week that may apply to this um, part of the conversation, definitely um, feel free to weave them in a little bit. For sure. I'm starting to I'm starting to go, to think I'm a good animator and not a good coach. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think both. Hopefully. And um, another common situation is when we are approaching towards this uh, black diamond on opposite um, and on opposite stack. And this time I put it on the left hand side of the down, it can come on it and in every area prior or just on the edge of this, um, it's black diamond. And again, we will see how we approach it to, uh, again, both sides of the, uh, of the playing field for the offense and the attack. The, the boat on, on, on the right, I mean, when they're looking down the, the downwind, the port attack. And here I, I want to emphasize, should, should aim to duck the other boat. That's their goal. Again, if the other boat is above the ley line, okay, playing in the third, or 28 area and inside. And one of the things I want to say here is like often we are waiting and that's why one of the things I like to say about the time here, this is the time here is a, a crucial. Often we, we wait until the last second and then if we duck on the last second, we see two boats sailing almost parallel to each other on a ridge. And then when you are trying to duck just behind this boat, uh, we will end up just too far. One of the tips for, uh, that I have here is actually to head up earlier and kind of losing distance a little bit in the beginning. So when you end up ducking the other boat and when you are just crossing the stand, you are like already on back on the downwind, the optimum VMG or even lower. And then you, as we will see in the video in a short, like it's your, you head up earlier and then you head down a bit earlier. And then the idea is actually to immediately after that, almost as part of the ducking to, uh, to try to sneak a perfect jive. Again, like we said, the boat handling here is like, uh, you have to master that. And I like how you approach it, Leo. And uh, when you are doing your practices, you're going through all the scenarios that possibly, so your sailors are ready. So, so, and this uh, maneuver is very easy to practice. It's very similar to a rabbit start on the up one. You have one boat, coming on starboard on the downwind and a line of boats um, needing to uh, clear her stern, duck her and on port and then jibe right in, in the inside. And then you can see if you can jibe and maintain and suddenly maintain the overlap once you jibe, uh, how, how hard to come up and duck that boat. So this is very easy. This specific maneuver is very easy also to practice and it's important to practice just for being Those able things. to implement that in the in a tactical scenario in the black diamond. Yes, and and people often ask me, how do you actually jibe and gain this overlap as we see? Remember that we are ducking the other boat. We're actually producing a, a big shade and block the wind of the boat that we are ducking them. So they're actually slowing down for a second. So if we actually master in this maneuver, we are able to, to sneak a jive behind it. Let's watch this video for a second. And then I see there's a couple of questions that I'm happy to go back to them. So again, you see the, the, the arrow, the path over there that what you don't want to do. You don't want to sail all the way to the last second and here sailing <laughs> on, 
almost parallel to one each other, opposite direction, and then you end up in a bad jive. You actually want to, what we'll see in the video, that this boat is heading up, up here now, and then slowing, heading down earlier, just ducking the other boat on downwind and not on a reach angle. So let's watch that. That's not the right pad that we want. We want to head up early and then head up also early and try to sneak a jive behind. And hopefully you are coming into the three board lengths and overlap. It's again, you think it's easy. Some people think it's harder. It's I I, I would say practice on that. I, I love that. Um, Justine, I see there's a couple of yeah, questions. We have, yep, we have two questions. Um, so from the second scenario that you um, went over with the inside boat, how could the gray boat defend against your bow to stern attack from the blue boat? Uh, I would say keep the distance. So I, I would not, well, like I said earlier, the timing is super important. Who is initiating the act and the timing is a super key. So if the blue boat is heading up, I will head up as well. And maintaining this distance, so you keeping this gap or space between you and the other boat, so you can actually initiate a jibe before the ley line and not get stuck. I hope it's answering. Leo, any other thoughts about that? Um, the gap is important, so you can still have ability to maneuver whatever you want to do. Plus, you're the boat that needs to uh, keep clear. Um, but that comment, I have another comment or something I want to say at the end. But that comes, it rings a flag to me in my mind saying, does it worth the fight to pass that boat or not? It's a question you need to ask yourself and it has so many different variables, which I don't want to touch now. And, but it's not the point. But also if you want defend, maybe a good defend is to round that mark at the right at the, at the stern of the boat in front of you. I mean, that's the best option you have. Totally agree. I think it's a, it depends on the situation. And this, this example is a one-on-one. -on -one. So if we're far away from the other boat and we are approaching to the last reach, maybe towards it, and if there's other boats around it and this fight will cause that the boat actually to catch up and we have another upwind, sometimes it's worth to just stay behind them and keep it the game simple. It all depends on the situation. There's so many variables, like you said, and it depends if it's one boat or a few boats, uh, definitely. And one thing I would like uh, add to say, like, remember if you are jibing and you're even calling it up loud, I, I'm, I'm, I'm ducking and giving you room. You have the right of way. Remember that if you initiate that or initiate a jive first, the other boat are not allowed to change by the rules, are not allowed to change the angle. Or if they change the angle, they have to give you an opportunity um, to, 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 to stay away, to keep room. So this is very important. And um, there was another question over there, Justine? Yep, we have two more questions. Um, so this one's from Mark. For the inside boat demonstration, the inside boat is sitting off the boom of the outside boat. We have trouble maintaining that position due to the air coming off the main of the other boat. How do you stay? Interesting. Um, I actually, again, I sell more than dinghies, um, big boats that the, the boom is coming out a bit more. Um, sometimes one of the things I will say, actually, I don't mind even to be half a board length. If I will go on this video, I will try to run this video again. Uh, and to stop it somewhere. This, this distance, when we are half a ball length behind, is enough. This scenario, if we can maintain this distance, the, the gray boat now cannot jive. They are not allowed to jive, and they cannot even producing a jive and duck, right? So this is, we are not overlap. It's fine as long as we are not going like this to the three board lengths. This is enough for us. Remember that I cannot jive and then you can push them. That's one of the things I said last week. There is a lot of situation that you actually want to slow down. So if you go in getting too close, yes, you will hit the boom over there. Awesome. And then uh, one, one more question from Philip. In the duck, would you free fly the spinnaker uh, on brief port jibe to make the return jibe cleaner? 
it depends again and that's there is what's called a, a free fly or rodeo jibe often um, I would think if you are going to the upwind, it's a great opportunity. If you are going to a reach, I will actually flip the boom and put it on a, on port and ready to be a, to be on port and then do a free fly or rodeo jibe, the last two jibe in the three board lengths. Uh, remember that you are jibing towards high mood. If you are jibing to a low mood or sailing by the lead, it's easier to flip, free fly the spinnaker. If you're jabbing to a high mode, it's very hard to fly the spinnaker, free fly the spinnaker without the spinnaker pull. So I see a, a little bit of a challenge there. One of the things I, I mentioned last week is that, that the variety of boat handling. It's when we are um, when we are sitting in open sea only by ourselves, we can do a perfect jibe from optimum angle, uh, VMG to VMG, and it looks great. The jibes in the race course are actually different. And Leo mentioned very well, you have to have this same um, skill set or the tools on your toolbox to have every type of jibe ready and master. Not, don't try it first time on the racing. Practice on that. Okay. And we go a little bit forward. We talked about this situation, how we actually want to head up early and dug early and hopefully do a perfect job here sneaky that uh, the green boat will have bad air and sneak into the three board lengths overlap over there i would like to talk on the opposite situation if we are the boat on starboard if we are the green boat and what do we want to do and here again i will go back to the timing who is initiate and the the offense or the control of the maneuver or the situation. So I think that the boat on the left, the starboard boat needs to head up earlier. And actually in, in, in a way that the other boat, they want to aim to, a, to the middle of the boat, almost to their stand. Remember, you're going in a high mode, you're going to the high boat speed. You want just enough to give the other boat another second or two, a doubt. Oh, maybe I can cross, maybe something changed. Maybe I. I can push it. Maybe it's not worth it for me to duck. And if you're doing that on the right timing, you actually trap the other boat in a situation that order they need to jive, they force to jive, an emergency jive on the last second because they have another two, two one or two seconds that they are doubting that, or that they are forced to do a, again this ducking, the bad ducking that uh, almost to a rich angle, and then they, they, it's very hard to do a ducking from a rich angle and to do a perfect jibe behind you. And then you actually force them to do a jibe way behind you and they cannot get, catch the, the, the overlap towards the mark. And there's two, two situations here, of course. And let's see what are the two options here. I split the red boat for a, a two boats. So there's two situation scenarios that the red boat can happen. I want, as a green boat, I want to head up and then put pressure on the red boat or to give them a doubt that maybe they can cross because something is changing. Again, the timing here is super important. Who is initiate the maneuver first? We we'll probably will have the control. And then you actually force the boat or to do a bad ducking here and very hard to jive back or to jive on top of you. And then you can so close into the three board lengths while they're outside. Any thoughts here, Leo? Uh, just impressed with your <laughs> video here. <laughs> I can no, share I the mean, video with I, you. I mean, I mean the, the idea of heading up relatively initiated, if you're the green boat heading up and then the red boat, oh, am I driving or am I ducking? No matter what, by the fact that you headed up, you accelerated. After the acceleration, Hopefully you added up a good timing and, and you caught a wave and you can uh, um, dive very, very low uh, dead damn wind or beyond by the lee or whatever. But the fact that you headed up, you accelerated. And that's, I think, the key for success. And one of my questions to you, there are a lot of um, uh, change of position, change, uh, change of angle of sail. 
what what are the important uh, things for you in order to be able to um, execute it right? Because so, we have a, so, so many controls in the boat. So I love how you say that, like, um, the, the timing, again, if we can pull the, compare the last two uh, scenarios, is like who have a better timing over there, uh, it, it will most likely, uh, or who initiate the situation is gaining, it will most likely will end up winning from the situation. And I love that you mentioned that they going up, you accelerate and putting a lot of pressure. This high pressure help you and high boats will help you to do more successful maneuver later on and to so close using this pressure if someone is jiving on you to so close. And there's a couple of things, few things that I, I will mention here. Obviously, our boat, uh, we're changing maneuver, so we have to adjust our body weight to help the boat to change angles. Otherwise, you're you are using too much the tiller and then we slow down. I will, every time when we're coming to this boat to boat situation or tactical or strong maneuvers, my biggest, my my instinct actually to, to uh, throw the, the standard board low. It's not slowing you down so much, but it will help you a lot to do maneuvers so not sliding and maintaining how pressure, high pressure on the boat. The crew needs to be ready to drop the guy forward. A lot of our sellers, especially the young sellers, uh, tend to sell with the guy uh, clipped and a square back. I'm not a big fan of that. I ready, I'm happy. I love to sell with the guy free. So if the skipper says, oh, we need to head up, I can throw the guy and he can head up a lot. And the big boat, of course, there is a trimmer, the guy trimmer and the, the sheet trimmer. The guy's um, sailor needs to be able to, uh, to ease the sheet a lot over there as we head up. And main, the main is a big factor over there. If you are heading up and keeping the main out, you have a lot of backwind on the main. It's almost like a break, trimming the main in, having opened the slot between the spinnaker and the main. Did I answer your question? Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Um, so now I actually flip on the other side. We're coming on the on the on a on a port tack on the right ley line again. If we are looking for, uh, forward, and we are in the boat in the back. We want, and again, like like you said, we want to be on top of our maneuver. We want. Um, to, to, to be ready for the maneuver, to initiate, to be aggressive. And remember, there is almost one. Most likely, if you try to head up on top of the, you want to head up on top on, to try to roll the boat ahead of you. And most likely, you will have maybe one opportunity. And so you have to have it perfect and a perfect timing. And when I'm saying timing, it's enough that the, the crew ahead of you kind of fluff the spinnaker so they cannot head up or they lost the power, or they surf too long on the wave or they don't see you. There's a lot of description for the timing, but you need to be ready. Send the boat down, main in, drop the guy again and try to find a good timing on your own wave so you head up a lot. And two scenarios will happen. One, the opponent will not see you and will give up and you just roll them and take the inside towards the mark again. The timing is just before the, 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 the three bornings. Don't try to do it too early. Then it will be more alert and be ready for that. Don't do it. Try to do it too late because it's already, they already took the inside. And the other scenario, well, and this is more complicated, the other boat is actually seeing you and ready for that. And we are sailing quite a long distance. Um, we are going on a high mode uh, on, a, on a fight. And there's two scenarios can happen over there. Or that you find the right timing to give up and so close and make it just just enough to make it to the mark and the other boat needs to do two jibes or both of you needs to do a jibe and then hopefully it's outside of the three board lengths and then potentially another opportunity arises so that's what i'm saying it's the timing again here is again super important and the execution it's it's also important so we are in the boat in the in the back the blue boat and the, the red boat there's two situation over here one is we are rolling on top of them. They are not even ready for that. And we just enough to take the three board lengths. So the timing is very important. The other situation is like that we actually make it to the mark and the other boat potentially need to do two more jives and all the, the leeward running for them is if it's to the reach or to the, or, or to a um, up when it's much harder. Yeah, obviously they need to, sometimes you need to give them the, the, the room but you can take it wide 
and hopefully they're doing a bad running and you have a better opportunity on the upward. So that's the boat in the back. Let's think about the boat, the boat in the front. And I mentioned last week, a um, few times that sometimes you actually want to slow down. It's amazing. We all the time think we want to sell, sell as fast as we can, as fast as we can. This is one of the one of the situation that we want maybe to to slow down. Uh, but before we are even talking about that, our boat speed, our goal is actually to trap the boat um, behind us into the leeward, or to head up and make enough separation so the other boat will not be tempted um, to head out on top of you. Again, you have to do it early enough so the other boat have no no any tools over there or no any opportunities and you are coming you you seal the inside early enough so as you go to three board lengths or just before the three board lengths you are focusing on the dials on the proper down and you don't get into this mess and crowded remember there's potentially there's other boats that are coming from the other side so you want to you know you want to put it off your checklist check the, this box early enough so you can focus on the proper downing also those both two if there's other boats, those two boats are coming as an outside. So you have to clear, clear all the mess early enough so you can do the best running. And again, it's one of the area that you want to, uh, the tip is to, to remember to put yourself in, in the head of the other boats behind you, what they will try to do. If they are the outside or in the back, will they accept running the, 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 the leeward mark as an outside? If they are good sellers, most likely not. Uh, so put yourself, understand who is the boat behind you and what are the options. So I, obviously that this video, the illustration here is, is quite aggressive, quite extreme, but if you see now that the boat, the red boat is what I like to say, to say they have the, the bow free, they can head up and head down how, however they want. And so they can play with me and they can take me to a fight all the way to the left lane line. And if I will do a, a rough maneuver, head up a lot and space out a little bit and take the inside aggressively or maybe even slow down aggressively and trap them to the leeward side, my game is much easier. So I'm heading up a lot here or spacing out or actually trap them. And now if we stop here on this, on this situation, let me move something here. I have the zoom. So if, if I actually stop here, the difference between this situation and this situation earlier, now that their bow is quite free, but if I slide a little bit forward on the, this video, now the red board is actually trapped. They cannot head up. They're not, they're, they're not allowed to head up way more than their proper course. And we are approaching to the three board lengths. So we have a bit more control here for the board. We actually want to trap them over there and, push them towards the outside lane line. Ah. So coming up to the last situation that we have today is kind of in between stage, right? Um, and again, I put it on the left lane line this time, two boat, it's a bit further away from the mark. And two boat uh, on the right hand side. And sorry, two boat, the boats are far away from the mark, close to the left lane line. The boat on the right hand side on port tack their goal is actually to jibe on top of the boat that comes from the ley line and in order to block their air. Now, two situations coming in here is that they have to bear away. They will not be happy to be in a bad air. So all that they were so close and then you want to so close with them, together with them. And one of the things we'll see on this uh, video clip is that we break the overlap and we'll talk about it in a second. And Anyway, but if you tie a jibe on top of them, they might, if it's far enough from the mark, they might do another two jibes and then you are separating them. Anything that you are doing here, 
um, you bring a new situation, new situation established. So you, you just want to put pressure on them and to jive on them on a bad, bad air. And hopefully they will react bad to that. The other situation is the, the, the boat on the left-hand side. And again, we're we are talking about far away and we need to be ready for, for mainly three situations. The first one is a strong maneuver to head down. If you remember, like we talked about it when we are a bit closer to the mark earlier, Leo. So as the other boat jibe on top of you, you're using this power, this high pressure to soak low and make the separation and have and break away from the, avoid the, the wind shadow. If they, they, they jibe, the other boat jibe quite late, and you have some space, you want to head up just to cross, just enough to cross the, uh, the wind shadow and to have a new, a new air. And I don't have it on the next video, it's just to cross enough on, and to have a new air in front of the, the, the board and jibe of you. Don't head up too much because remember we are, we are approaching to, toward the three board lengths. So you don't want to head up too much and then both two boats are heading down together. And then they actually gain the inside, stay on, on their bow and even leeward to their bow. So you stay, you take the leeward lane, but have, make sure you have the free air, the, the new air in front of the other boat. And the third option is maybe if you did the, the good job jiving as, as the outside boat, as the, the green boat on starboard, if we do a good job jiving on, the, on this red line of the 28 or the third rule, you will have enough distance and to do a too quick jibe, to do another big separation, and then it can come hot again towards the three board links. That will be, and I cannot tell you which one is one. And what I will tell you is again, you need to be ready for what coming up next. And you need, the team need to be ready and the decision need to be, um, you need to take the action. You need to have it to be a sharp, immediate and assertive. And you, you, your team, your crew have to be ready for that. I would say one thing, there's so many options. My biggest tip is actually to take one of the options, to be ready for that and to, to commit to that. If you're trying to, there will going to be a mixed communication over there or try to do too many things, you most likely will lose. Take one action and go for it. Believe in that. Anyhow, you will have a new situation because it's in between, it's quite far away from, the, from this black diamond area. So again, the blue boat is jibing here. And then the green boat, as you see, they did a strong maneuver to head down. Hopefully we actually catch them. We are trying to soak low. And here's another timing. So like we said earlier, it's a green boat. I will head up and stick my bow and maintain the overlap sometimes. And it's maybe connected to the questions that we had earlier on the chat. Put my spinnaker on the main of the blue boat, so that will maintain the overlap over there. And as the, the blue boat, what I will try to do just before the overlap, and I don't know if Leo, if you're working with your athletes like that, is to, just before the overlap, is to head up a lot. Oh, shoot, sorry for that. So if I'm the blue boat here, I will, as a blue boat, I will initiate a very strong high maneuver to head up and then I can overlap, I can break the overlap just before the three board length. If I will be the skipper, I will even go with my hand to the stand and show there is no overlap. Just to clarify it also to the jury and the other witness and opponents to show. I'm clear coming in three board lengths. And there's always argument on this area, but this is one of the things that I recommend on this situation and coming into three board lengths. Any thoughts here, Leo? I, again, risk versus reward, in, in my opinion. That's, that's at least my, my approach there. When you go, when you have uh, these situations, and let's say you broke the overlap, and that boat did not give you room, and you rounded on the outside, and you were right, she was wrong. You're going, if there was no contact, 
maybe nothing happened. Maybe she'll get disqualified. Maybe it will be dismissed. But the door opens up here to a lot more complicated scenario. So again, my question is to ask myself, what part of the race am I in? Am I driving into a reach to go to the finish? Am I going up one? That means that I have at least one, two or three more legs to try to pass that boat. Maybe my priority now is to have a perfect mark rounding right behind her. She's so uh, uh, she's so focused to uh, be in the inside boat. I will be focused to be on the lifted tack and the on the next up one. I totally agree. With I could I, I don't think you could say it any better. Like the, the situation is, is where are we? Are we going to the last leg for today? After all the rest, it's simple. You understand there's a lot of opportunity. to try to win everything at this moment. Boat by boat, leg by leg, race by race, I like to say it. And before I go into the top mark, and, and we need to understand, maybe we, we, we lost this small fight, but we still have opportunity, and if we're doing perfect running, and they are stuck there, so hectic, just keep it cool, understand, communicate with your teammate, if it's one or like a, a big boat, no worries, we just roll behind them, and we'll, we'll find a better opportunity, we still have another reach, let's make sure that we are ready for the reach, and we'll pass them on the reach, and you know what? Even if they stay ahead of you, don't take any risk. If there's a pack of bullets behind you, you lose one point. It's a series of a, a, a regatta. Uh, all, all, you don't want to lose everything in first race or the, the beginning of the, of the series. I love it. Um, happy to bring some more questions if anyone have. Are we good over there, Justine? Yeah, Udi, I had one. Um, when you were looking at the three different scenarios for the two boats, inside or outside, and how um, you're prepared to kind of initiate the reaction and whatnot, what are some tips that you have for um, communication amongst the crew, whether it's a double-handed or a big boat with multiple people sailing, um, in terms of how they can prepare to execute those um, maneuvers assertively and uh, efficiently so that they have success? I know it's a big process. I, I will take what Lior said in the beginning of this talk and practice and, and, to, and, and, and it takes time to build layer on layer. So you're doing the basic and then another more complicated back or jive or maneuver or rounding, another more maneuver, another maneuver. So have this skill set and I will connect it to what I said earlier today and last week. You need to have keyword of what and Sometimes I have more. Uh, when we, Leo and I sell together, and or when I sell with my my other teammate Gidi for more than 30 years, we it, our cures were quite easy because we spoke Hebrew, and especially when we sell internationally, and there was no any we could say we talk to one each other in Hebrew, and it was exactly we knew exactly what would come to happen. But I would recommend, especially here when you're selling the states and everyone understand everything all in the international language English to have your own keyword that only your team will understand what it means and you're ready for that and that actually it's your own a special specific language that all the teammates your your, your crew and everything will be ready know what to do with the standard board with the guy with the main and know what the boat will do to have a specific plan a specific scenario and everyone on the same board and I will, I will, I will, um, I will go for that. It will simplify all the game. Again, to be prepared and to be set for one scenario is the best possible. Awesome. So practice, practice, practice. <laughs> and be ready. Uh, know which tool you're using when. Um, so one question came in with this last scenario that you have up um, from Paul, and he's wondering if there is a racing rule 17 issue here. Yeah, numbers. What's the rule exactly? If we can call it out, I'm not sure I can put it out. It take me a minute. I think proper is pro proper course from. I don't have a rule book with me. Lior, do you know off the top of your head? While we look this into this, we can uh, we can get another question. It was mentioned to focus on lifted tack on next windward leg going into bottom mark. 
Have you assessed which tack is lifted before bottom mark? And if so, how does that impact your plan? Um, definitely. So this black diamond is maybe the last half a minute, up to one minute. Um, I would, like I said earlier, the handoff to the next leg should come before we are coming to this boat and boat. We are too focused and too distracted from boat to boat, rules, maneuvers, techniques, special techniques, communication. So you cannot think about the big picture. If you can have at least set plan and said, okay, this is what we have. And knowing if the, if the shift is what's important for you, put it up on top of the back of your mind, on top of your list, our exit shift, the shift of the next leg is the most important. So as you go up, you, you use this shift, but do a handoff and do a brief plan before you're coming to this black diamond situ situation, and then break it out. Um, leeward overlap. So the, the, I just read that the, it's a leeward overlap, proper course, you were right, Justin. For the other questions about it, the, the green board can head up. Can head up as long as um, and they are on the proper course. Um, if you are sailing into the five or 10, 10 degrees angle of the downwind, again, every jury will see it later. I will not say specifically any conditions be, uh, do, it will be different. Of course, if you're, you are on the leeward boat and there is, if you are the leeward boat, you are, you are limited to the proper course. So I will not do a rough maneuver over there, but remember that if we look in the beginning of the video, it's the blue boat that initiate the jibe. They initiate the jibe, they jibe on top of you. You have the right of way to laugh as much as you can. If you came from the back and initiate overlap, then you're restricted by the proper course, proper course. And then I think everywhere playing between five or 10 degrees, you, you, you're still good. In the down when you have variety of angle, no one can tell you if this five or 10, my opinion, again, I'm not a referee or a jury or a judge. And my opinion of five or 10 degrees on the down is totally fine to do a proper setting, your best setting towards the red mark when it's becoming more than 50, 20, 15, 20 degrees, depends on the condition. That might be an issue. Uh, if you are heading up intentionally to love the other board, that's becoming an issue, uh, but definitely. But again, the blue board jibe on top of you here, they initiate the position, they came on overlap. So the green board have the, the the right of way to laugh as much as they can, if I understand it right. Excellent. So that uh, that wraps up the questions for the day. Um, I want to thank everyone uh, who joined us, and thank you, Lior and Udi, for being a part of the portal. Um, please join us this week for more live sessions. And just a reminder, you can uh, rewatch this in the part one of Udi's two-part series on the Starboard Portal on the US Sailing website. Um, we encourage you all to keep tuning in. Please know that your membership and your support is what keeps these programs running. Thank you to our members and our donors who support the organization. Um, if you'd like to join, renew, or make a donation, please visit our website and do so. Um, with that, again, Udi and Lior, thank you for being with us today. And thank you for being a part of US Sailing. Of course, Thanks for. Yeah, thanks for inviting me over, Udi and yes. Justine. Thank you. I want to say thank you very much for Leo. It was great to see you. another friend that I haven't seen for a long time because of all the situation that we're here. Thank you, Leo, for joining us. It was great to do it with you. And yep. thank you, Coach, for everyone. People probably know about you, but you don't know. He's one of the best coaches, great sailors out there. And thank you, Justine, again, and your sailing for all the things that you are doing. I think it's great for our community, great in, this, in our new life. And I think it's a great opportunity. There's so much, it's amazing content here in the Starboard Portal, which would be great for all our sailors, from kids to adults, to a huge community and to be out there. It's a great opportunity and I'm honored to be part of it. And 
over the like I said over the past week, a lot of people reach out for questions, and from uh, the the slides of the the presentation, more than happy to answer any questions, clarify. Feel free to reach out to me on those aspects. There is the my my app that will come out for like a sports psychology that will come out very soon. So feel free to 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 look up on that and be ready. It will launch very very soonly. And over the past week, a lot of uh, there was few uh, selling programs and other um, sellers that reach out for me to do other uh, presentations. If it's on selling, other aspects of selling, not just downwind, starts up in practice, whatever it needs to. For sports psychology, I'm very happy to help and support whoever needs to. So thank you again for everyone, and I hope to see everyone again on the water very very soon. Awesome, Rudy. Yes, two fantastic, knowledgeable, and uh, talented coaches on with us today. So thank you for sharing your knowledge and uh, the playback between you two is excellent. So appreciate that. Thank you, guys. Oh, tuning out. <laughs>